Hey everyone, welcome back. So today we're going to be looking at coding kernels in SVM. So we just had a bunch of videos on advanced topics in SVM, especially kernels, and why they're so powerful and help us extend this idea of SVM to more real-world cases. And in this video we look at uh, various experiments involving kernels and coding kernels in SVM. So you may have already noticed, but we'll be using R for this video. We use Python for most of the videos on this channel. And that's mostly because I think it's more applicable for industry. I've used it more. But at the same time, I know that if you're in academia or if you're in college right now, R might be the language you're using. So let's do a video in R and let's talk about this cool topic of SVM kernels. First thing you're going to want to do is import this library with a funny name called E1070. So I'm not 100% sure why it's called this, but this is where most of the functionality of SVM lives in R. And so we'll want to import that library. The next thing is I'm going to generate some data according to a complex polynomial decision boundary. And instead of going through the code, let me just show you the results. So I'm going to generate training and a testing set um, according to this complex polynomial decision boundary. So here's the training data. As you can see, the decision boundary is cubic. And there is a class 0 mostly on top and a class 1 mostly on the bottom. Now, what makes this kind of applicable and more real-world-ish is that the decision boundary, first of all, is not just linear. And the second thing is that if you look at the two classes, they're kind of intersecting with each other, which means that even a very powerful SVM model still won't be able to get a 100% accuracy because there's places where the data is just kind of intermingled with each other. But we're going to see which SVM model gives us the best possible accuracy on the testing data, which looks like this. So the testing and training data look very similar. They are coming from the same uh, decision boundary polynomial, but there's different amounts of randomness built into each data point, and so they are two different data sets with the same signature. So we're going to be building SVM models on the training data and seeing what the accuracy is on the testing data. So the first experiment we're going to do, the first of three, is trying out different types of kernels. So as we saw in our theoretical kernel videos, we mainly focused on two kernels, the polynomial kernel, which takes into account second degree, third degree, and so on interactions between your original variables, and this uh, radial basis function kernel, which takes this idea to its extreme. Basically, we're taking into account the infinite polynomial interactions between your data, which is why part of why it's so powerful. But there's also other kernels we didn't look at. For example, sigmoid is another one that people have thought of. And the last one in this list is linear. Linear kernel is actually the simplest because it, we're not doing anything. We're simply just taking the data and projecting it into the same exact dimensional space. So this is kind of our control to see how much better the other ones do. So let's look at the output of, again, let me show you the basics of the code so you understand what's going on. We use the SVM function here, and we train the SVM model on the training data. Then we predict the labels of the testing data, and then we calculate the accuracy of those predictions. So these three lines, very simply, are fitting the model using a particular kernel, k. So let's look at the results by using the four various types of kernels. Here's linear. And as the name linear would suggest, we are not transforming the data at all, which is why the decision boundary looks linear. And you can see for a linear kernel, it's doing the best it can do, which results in an accuracy of about 69%. And let me explain um, what you're looking at here in this picture. This is the testing data. So all the points you see here are testing data. And the color of the point is corresponding to the prediction from that particular SVM model for that particular kernel. These smaller dots you see, like here and here, those are not uh, active testing points. But this is saying that if there was a testing point up there, it would be categorized in 0. Or if there was a testing point down here, it would get categorized as 1. So these smaller dots help visualize the uh, split, where the model is splitting and choosing to classify as zeros versus 1. So it splits up the decision space. So we can see how are we going to do better than 69%, for example. Using a polynomial kernel, weirdly enough, we actually do worse. It's doing some weird kind of split. Um, I don't think this is because the polynomial kernel is weak. I think it's because there's certain parameters in the polynomial kernel that we should probably tune, like the degree of the polynomial and some other things. Uh, the reason I chose not to tune that for this video is because, as we'll see, the radial basis function kernel just kind of does great right out the gate, so I chose to focus on that going forward. But for a real-world problem, you'd want to not only look at the default setting of all these kernels, but also uh, various setting of the parameters. So if we look at the radial basis kernel, as mentioned before, it's doing great just in its default state. 
we get an accuracy of about 76% right out the gate. And you can see that, as we saw in the radial basis video, it is really kind of trying to match this decision boundary well. It's able to take into account these non-linearities in a real nice way. The sigmoid kernel kind of fall apart completely, but again, I don't think this is necessarily because the sigmoid kernel is weak. I think there are certain parameters that we should have tuned if we were going down the sigmoid route. But we'll go down the radial basis function kernel route for the rest of this video. So there's two more experiments now that we're going to run. And these experiments are, we're going to first of all hold the kernel as radial basis for the rest of this video. We're going to be looking at the effect of two important parameters on the effect of the model. So the first one is called gamma. Now it'll be much more clear as I show you the pictures, but first let me try to explain at a high level what this gamma parameter is doing. We're trying values of this parameter from 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 all the way up to 1000. The smaller this value is, the more points, the more training points we're going to take into account around some testing point that we're trying to classify. The bigger this is, so if this is like 1000, then this becomes extremely localized, which means that when we're looking at a testing point, we're only considering the training points that are like really close to it when making a decision. So it's a question about should I use a lot of my data to make this decision or should I only use very local data? And this is another way of stating the bias variance trade-off, but let's look at the pictures as we have that discussion. So I've printed out uh, the effect of the predictions of the model for all these different values of gamma. So we said the lowest one here is gamma equals 0 0.01. And it looks like a linear boundary, which is weird because we're using a radial kernel. But remember that with a very low gamma, anytime we're predicting a point, we're taking into account virtually all of the training data. Uh, and this is good in the sense that this model is going to have low variance, which means that if I were to tra uh, change some of the training points here and there, it wouldn't affect the prediction because those small changes in specific training points get washed out when we consider all of the training points because of this small value of gamma. But it also means that this model has very high bias, which means that on the training data, it's not going to be able to predict even the training data very well. It's not taking into account the necessary small changes in the data, the nuances, the nonlinearity. It's kind of just averaging everything together. So this is probably not the way we want to go. The accuracy here is only 69%, which is about the same we got with a linear kernel before. So let's increase gamma, keeping in mind that increasing gamma means we're going to be making the model more and more local, taking into account more and more local points, and so the decision boundary will get more and more irregular. So here's point one. You can see there's a slight curvature now to the decision boundary because we're taking into account local changes only, and now our accuracy has actually jumped up to 74%, which is nice. If we do gamma equals 1, it goes up again to 77%, which I think is what the default looked like. Yeah, about that. Let's increase gamma more. So we get 77%. So we went up a little bit, but we see weird things happening now. For example, even though we didn't actively have any testing points up here, if we did, they would get categorized into class 1, which is a little bit weird. So let's keep that in mind as we increase gamma more. Now we increase gamma to 100, and our accuracy actually goes down. And we see kind of weird things happening where this whole space up here is categorized as a 1 and doesn't seem natural anymore. And let's take it to its extreme. So if gamma is equal to 1,000, our accuracy has dropped back down to about 69%. And this is what our uh, predictions look like. What's happening here, keeping in mind that a very large value of gamma means we're becoming extremely localized, we'll get this opposite case where our variance is actually huge, which means that small changes, small noise in the training data is going to have huge impacts on our predictions and our model, which is why you're seeing this very noisy prediction space here. Uh, the good thing about this is that it has low bias, which means on the training data it's going to do great, but that doesn't generalize well to the testing data, as we can see here. So the best gamma is probably something around 1 or 10, uh, so something around 0.1 to 10. I would say, because that's a good balance between bias and variance. The other parameter that we are going to talk about is cost. So this is a parameter called cost that you're able to change. So cost is kind of nicely named because it is the cost of making a mistake. Now, let me backtrack for a second. Uh, we're looking at soft margin SVM, obviously, in this video, because the hard margin SVM case cannot even take into account uh, cases where the data is intermingled with each other. So we're looking at the soft margin case where we allow for errors here and there, but we give a penalty to these errors when they happen. And by error, I mean um, a point that is classified in the wrong class. 
And so we allow these misclassifications to happen if it means that our model is more generalizable and we're getting the majority of the data points correct. But that doesn't mean that we're not allowed to change the weight on these errors. So this cost parameter, which we're giving the value C, where C ranges between 0 0.01 and 1 million, is exactly the cost that you need to pay for every mistake that you make in your soft margin SVM problem. Now it's gonna be much more clear what I'm saying when we look at the pictures. So let's look at the result for cost is equal to 0 0.01. So this looks like, uh, not linear exactly, but it's not as curved or not taking into account as many of the non-regularities, uh, non-linearities as before. And notice that this case is cost equals 0 0.01, which means that there's a very small cost you're paying to make each of these mistakes in the soft margin SVM case. And the next logical place to go from there is that because there's such a low cost for each mistake, we're able to make lots of mistakes in our SVM case, which means our model is able to generalize very, very, very well. In this case, maybe it's generalizing even too well, which is why we're not really taking into account the uh, irregularity, the nonlinearity of our data. So in terms of the bias variance trade-off, the variance of this model is low, but the bias is gonna be high. Let's see what happens when we increase the cost, the penalty that we have to pay for each mistake. So if cost goes up to one, then we see that we're able to take into account these nonlinearities a lot better, and our accuracy actually goes up a little bit. And so let's keep increasing the cost and see if it, at some point this reaches a best possible case. So if cost is equal to 100, we get about the same accuracy, but we start seeing these weird artifacts where parts of the decision space are labeled in ways that we wouldn't necessarily expect. If we increase the cost up to 10,000, then we see that it's actually doing kind of well. If we increase the cost up to a million, this is where it kind of breaks down. So our accuracy has gone back down, and this kind of looks like a huge mess, but let's talk about where this huge mess comes from. Now the cost is a million, which means that for each mistake we make in the soft margin SVM case, we're gonna pay a massive cost. What that means is the model is going to wanna make as few mistakes as possible, ideally none. What that means is that the decision boundary is going to have to get really, really intricate and complex so that we're not making any mistakes at all on the training data. What that means is that the bias is going to be low, which means the training data is taken care of. But the model has gotten so complex, has such a high variance, that it doesn't generalize well to the testing data, as we can see here. It's become complete trash on the testing data, which is why our accuracy went down. So the best cost was probably something around one or 100, something around that range. Definitely not a million, and definitely not 0 0.01. And so that's the end of this video. Um, the main stuff I wanted to get across is that we can very easily code different kernels. There's just built-in kernels. But furthermore, we can set different parameters on those kernels. Uh, for example, gamma and cost are the most important ones. And you're gonna wanna try out many different values of these kernels if you're doing a real problem, and use something like cross-validation to see which is the best one. Okay, so hopefully um, this helped you understand coding SVM kernels a little bit better, gave you a little bit of R code that you can add to your repository. Uh, this code will be available to you in the description below, and I'll see you next time.